Okay, I'm JJ Jackson. This is my wife, Lisa Jackson. We're here, I guess, to talk about McDade pottery that's on exhibit. First of all, we have here is a piece of Duncan pottery. I don't know if it's Matthew or George Duncan. It was a father-son thing, but because it's not marked. But they opened in 1853 in the Bathurst State Park. And they produced wares until after the Civil War. And then somewhere in the 1880s, they sold out to Milton Stoker. And he worked the jug shop for several years in the park. But he moved it to McDay because of the railroad there and better clay. Later, it was sold to R.L. Williams in 1888. <clears throat> and he became, he made it, he named it McDay Pottery. And they built a new pottery and made it. It's the biggest industry in Bastrop for a long time. And wasn't it common for <clears throat> places to move around, these organizations to move around because Not they the were site. sold after clay? Not the site, no? the people moved. The people moved. Potterers. A lot of people say a McDay pottery has to be, you can identify it because the handle on a jug goes from from the beehive up to the, to the neck, where all Meyer pottery pieces generally go up from the beehive part to the beehive, never touch the neck. Others have different things, but you can find all works of different different pottery, different master potterers. You can tell that they came from somewhere else. And it goes up and comes right back to the beehive, just like one made in Meyer's. And my belief is, you can, you can throw a lot of clay in a few days or a week, and you have to put it under tarp to keep it because you can only cook so many. And it took seven to 10 days for the kiln to cool down and then remove them and get all ready to cook again. And you bring it to a certain temperature, you leave it there however many hours, and then you gotta let it cool off slowly. So you'd have a lot of greenware, and I'm sure employees would be out of work. So we'd leave from San Antonio, they'd go to Gonzales or something, come up to Bastrop for a few days and make wares and then leave again. That's, I really believe that because you can see all their different styles with all the different potters. So some of them were master potters, I'm sure, that went from place to place because they just out of work. I had a newspaper article in time from like 1936 from San Antonio and it showed um, who Gus Meyer. It had a picture of Gus Meyer on the front with a wheel and it said he could make 600 one gallon jars in a day. <laughs> and you're like, that's impossible by hand. But when you read through it and you turn the pages, seven people cleaned the clay, two people waited. It was an assembly line. All he did was get his hand wet. Somebody else moved his wheel for him. All he did was move this. Somebody cut it, moved it. He did this it's all day long. <laughs> it was like... Was That's still a lot. Oh, yeah, it a lot. But it worked 12 hours a day also. This, yeah. They didn't have any... It was 12 hour days. We just, we've been collecting for 20 years. And we just rounded up some stuff, so... How did you get started? We bought a home in Page, Texas, 10 miles from McDade, from uh, Mrs. Long, Ruth Long. And that home was a log cabin in 1849. They remodeled it in 1879 when the railroad came through. And our friends when we bought it said, we wanted to make it, put it back like it was. Take the asbestos off, put the board and batons back on. And they said, you should put Texas furniture, Texas paintings and Texas pottery, things in there that would have been in there in 1879. So. So that my we wife started wanted. and McDade was close by, and so we started with <coughs> local uh, items. We came across quite a few, and JJ was one of the only ones at that time interested in McDade pottery. Most people wanted the more well-known pottery. Um, Wilson or Myers. Wilson, Meyer, and Myers pretty painted pieces, and so these are generally very similar in color. 20 years ago. The brown and the tan. They put some cobalt blue on some of them, but for the most part, they didn't have as many decorative pieces right. as other potters. These were utilitarian pieces. And so they were, every household had those. And they were readily available 20 years ago. I could go out and buy 15 or 25 in a day. And so <coughs> his collection grew and he has miniatures and large ones and just a variety of pieces. And it turned into a really fun hobby for us to go out together and, and find pieces. And they weren't expensive at that time. But well, we have other things now. We collected furniture and paintings and just different things from the Bastrop County mostly. My best quality pieces came from a man named John Sinclair, and all he's done is antiques all his life. The bricks are from Butler. These, the ladies just wanted them because they're from Belgium. But McDade made brick, but I haven't ever seen a brick that says McDade on it from McDade. But they did make bricks. And they didn't mark a lot of things. I don't know why, but like their jugs, they very rarely would would, would put a stamp, like that one has a mark on it, but and they didn't hardly ever mark souvenir pieces, a little, we call them souvenir pieces, but they were really seldom samples, because the seldom would have a, a butter churn and a little pitcher and all these, well, different things, and you could get it any size you wanted when you ordered through them. 
So talk about the salesman <coughs> samples that we have here. First, let's talk about the crock that we all love the most on top here. A lot of people love that the most. That was made by <laughs> Stoker, and they love it because of all oh, this glaze here. And then, remember in my home, I have a five, a four, a three, and a two with the blocks. And this exact same five, you can see it on butter churns, jars, jugs, a lot of Stoker pieces. Obviously, he only had one, or he may have had more, but for a long time, that one, that one stamp seemed to stick around. And to me, that's really neat. But McDade Potter does a lot of the same things. If you see the two right here with that circle on it, mm -hmm. that same, same two is on 50 pieces that I own that has a mark on it that says it's McDade. And it's cobalt. But, so they kept that stamp around for a long time, too. But this is, that is a really great piece. And Stoker, he bought out the, you know, the Duncan, the jug shop from the Duncans, and he moved it to McDade. And, but he only had it for a couple of years there. And then he took on a partner, R.L. Williams, for a couple of years, and then Wayne's body mounts. But these are the self, the Selma samples. I, I found out later. I found out after I'd been collecting for probably three years or four years. Every every butter churn that came my way, I bought it. I didn't turn one down for 15 years. So, but the little pieces are real, real sought after. The little pitcher with the cobalt. I have larger pictures. I have a quart and a two quart. The same deal. It's, it's brown and white, but it has a cobalt. What it flowers or splashes on it? But the, the butter churns, a lot of times when you find them at a state sale or at, at, out in the brush at an auction at some farm and they bring out stuff, they'll have a pitcher and a butter churn together in the set. And I'm, they must have got them from the factory or somewhere along one of the roads at the, in the time, and they bought it as a set for children to play with. But there's a hundred times more butter churns out there than there is pitchers. But so the pictures are more valuable than the churns. The um, the little piggy banks, they're real collectible. I mean, a lot of people like the banks. <clears throat> this one says Watson Brothers from McNay, Texas. And on the other side, it says Breeder of Large Poems. They raised hogs. And they would give these away to their customers. And this is the only one known, the only one I know of, that's not broken. I've seen another one, but they're all broken from the top. You break the top out and you get your coins out. So, <laughs> This, I guess it doesn't have any coins in it. Right, there's not a coin <laughs> on the bottom. There's not an opening on the bottom. And so it's very uh, rare that you find these little banks any longer because people, even if the the elders in the family cared for it, their children would come along and somebody would eventually get into that bank. And what's that money? <laughs> oh, they have a lot of different banks. The Cathead Bank that here is unglazed. It's the only one I have, but I have seen them in the yellow. I've seen orange ones, green ones, and I've seen them stamped on the bottom of McDay Pottery. But they're... They're hard. I mean, I walk for a lot of money for me. You can't buy them. So. And then the pictures. I was playing the one on the end though, because Susan and I were like, "What With the, the finial heck on the top is of it on? on the far side? Yeah, is it a finial? What do what would they call that kind of bank? That's what I call it. I don't know what they would have called it, <laughs> but that I want to say this is from a press mold, but I don't know that. But I've seen them when they have been almost perfectly exactly the same. But I've seen them orange and green. And paint it, you know, and so I don't know. It almost has to come from a press to be exactly the same. I think they had a press. No, I know they. Yeah. Georgina Greer is American Stoneware book. Georgina Greer, who's she's known as the authority on stoneware from way back when. She said McDay Pottery never made a piece of stoneware from a press mold, but that's incorrect. Because I have some. She just didn't. You know, I probably ran a piece that she'd never seen before, and there's a lot out there, but they did have press molds. The corn pitchers. There's three different ones. There's a blue and an orange one looks like corn, and then this purple and green one. And they're marked. There's what do you call it? Scribed. They had to have an incised piece of wood with it. On the bottom it says "Day Pottery." You when you push it into the clay before you fire it, yeah. it's on the bottom. Big Day Pottery on the bottom. The ashtrays up here. I don't know the date when they came out. I don't know that anybody does, but I have. I have four different ones, and I've, I've seen, there are eight different ones that I've seen. And they all have the same characteristics, they're just different colors. They have a different hat and a different color tie. And they almost always, except for this guy, all the other ones have a cigar. And it's just, you can tell it's an ashtray. And so, they're really, really hard to find. Those are my favorite, I guess. So the next piece down here is a chamber pot. And Red Long would drive from Bastrop out the page on Saturdays to see his girlfriend Saturday evening. And his, 
Mrs. Long's sister's husband would come in from Giddings all the way to Page, which is 11 miles, and they would meet there and they'd, you know, her mama would fix a dinner and they'd have dinner. She said, but you know, we really did trick our mom and dad. And Miss Long, if you know her, I mean, she wouldn't tell a fib in, in a million years, just as honest as can be. And she said that the rule was, if, if you or your date had to go to the restroom, the date was over. You, you know, say, I gotta go. And the boys knew it, the girls knew it. Well, y'all gotta go. <laughs> so the date was over. So her and her sister hit this chamber pot upstairs. In the, in, uh, one of the, they didn't have fathers, they had wardrobes and such. But they had it some form of a container or something where they hid this chamber pot. And they would get busy and start doing something outside or something. One would disappear. And they would go upstairs to the chamber pot and they'd try to sneak it out the next day. And for Miss Long to tell me that, I mean, it was like, really, it was really wonderful that she shared that story with us. And I will always cherish it. The water jug down here, uh, Payne Williams in 1998 had an auction. They had an auction at his home to sell off everything bought to their parents. And they sold lots and lots of stones. Like, well, I wish I could go back and be there. but. And this was sold to another person who later set up at my house. I had a pottery show for nine years in a row at my house in March. And he set up and he had brought this for me and let me buy it from him. And so that came out of their house. They would have drank water or lemonade, whatever, out of it, tea. Would the top have been wood? Or would it no, have been stone? No, it would have been stone. Okay. That other one I have is stone, yeah. So. And then the next pieces we have are chicken waters, or two different styles. They're both on what they call the burp system, or burp style. I don't know what they I guess it sounds like a burp when it gets air in it, but you fill them up, this thing, you submerge it in water, turn it over, and if the water can't come out, the chicken drink it down with air, and get in, and it goes boop, and it fills it back up. But I will promise you, this one, that water would get really, really hot. And the other one would set in a tray that was higher than the hole, and then as the water level dropped below the hole, it would let water out to them, fill it up above the hole again. It'd be like putting your finger over a straw, and it would stop the cycle. Then the next ones are the ant traps. I love the display. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are ants in there. Yeah. That was great. That's a Texas Those are ant. Texas ants. That's a yeah. Texas ant. <laughs> yeah. And ant traps, of course, were used on your tables to put kerosene, or I guess you can do water, but a lot of people say under the, the leg goes in the center where it's dry, and then the kerosene goes in the outer part. If you look at a lot of pieces of Texas furniture, especially tables, they have a stain on them. It's about an inch and a half or two inches thick. That's where that kerosene got over there and wicked up a little bit of the stain. They, uh, all the all the people who made there made hand traps. Junkers made them, stokers made them, everybody made them. Myers was very, very sought after. There are some that used to be in that one museum in Houston for a while, I guess, was from Angus Meyer. She always topped her pieces with a gold ring. That was her signature. And there was an ant trap that painted real beautifully and had that gold ring around, so you know that they could admire it now. A beautiful ant trap. Oh, yeah. And, and the art pieces, there's a lot of blue bonnet and scenery. Oh, yeah, a lot of painted red. pieces. But oh, she yeah. was an artist. She had a painting. Not blue bonnet like you think, just blue bonnet flowers. No, it was like um, a pasture scene, fields. fields no, you know, with the bonnet. Uh -huh. She did them on. on that's why Meyer was so much more sought after for people who are brand new collectors <clears> than someone who wants yeah. the, the plain utility. And they were in business till the 60s. So there's a lot more pieces out there than you have to go. What's the next piece is a butter churn. The number two and the number three gallon butter churn are the most common. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care about opinions. I know this. I got 10 times more of them than the one gallon. The one gallon cost more because they're very rare, but they would only make a handful of butter. And it takes just as much to make a handful as it does two gallons. Yeah. So they didn't do it very often. The rarest one that I have, I've just, I just got one about four years ago, is a six gallon that would have come from the Driscoll Hotel or one of the big hotels where I guess people have to trade off to make six gallons, but it has been a lot of work. But the six gallons are really hard to find. But the twos and threes are the most common. Well, it's just a five gallon jug, it's a double handle, it's a big thing, and it's marked. They made lots of them, but I don't know what they would have stored in it. You can't get it that much vinegar. Yeah. 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 Vinegar was a staple for everything. They didn't have a lot of preservatives. Oh, that's true. They used yeah, vinegar yeah. to staple everything. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and maybe a lot of the store owners had it in the store to, to distribute vinegar or whatever. Oh, like big sell jug. it individually. Yeah. Of course, the co most common jug is a one gallon. There's a lot of quartz. Yeah. Quartz yeah. 
And we didn't bring them one. Yeah. And people reuse their pieces over and over, correct? Like they would bring it and share with their neighbor, go to the store and get their jug filled up again. Or they would make sauerkraut with the weight in one of the crocs. And that was what always, you know, mama or grandma always used the same, the mm -hmm. same piece for a certain tasks, just like we do today. And here's some of my favorite pieces. This is, well, the Champion Clay Ironing Furnace. Mm -hmm. R.L. Williams came out with it, I think, in 1909 or 1911. It was patented in 1911. 11. And it it changed. It changed. And they shipped them all over the country. There's a. I had a picture on this book. There's a picture of thousands of them stacked up. And then the the Elgin Courier at the time said that they moved 20,000 a month wow. out of out of McDade. Wow. But what it was designed for originally was. When you wanted to go to church on Sunday and you had a sad iron, you had to heat up the whole house. You get the cook stove, fire it up, stoke it, put a bunch of wood in there, heat it up. And in August, that's just man, then nobody you like mama them. And she would iron her dress or the girl's dress with two or three different sad irons. He came up with this. He he made it, and the little vent on the front makes it hotter or colder. So you can make it as hot as you want. And he'd have two sad irons in the in the furnace and take the other one iron with it, lift up an iron, set it back. You didn't have to heat up the whole house. You just take the furnace outside when you're done. And they heated it with charcoal or, or coke, which is brown lignite coal, and it would get really, really hot. And they made them different sizes. We can see on the on the uh, the little invoice here. They made them from number one all the way up to number sixes, and they did one through six. The ones with feet. I had some at my house that have feet on them, and I guess you could sit on the kitchen table and sit right there and do all your ironing. And in one of the advertisements in here, it's find this. I not this messy. It said that, uh, oh, right here, the clay furnaces for ironing, cooking, picnics, hunting trips, etc. But you can do it, they ended up using it for a lot of different things. Take it to your neighbor when the fire goes out in the wintertime. They can just come get a whole bucket of hot coals and let me know what it is, and it'll start a fire then. I always picture that maybe they would take it to the outhouse and it was especially cold. Oh, <laughs> I don't know that. But I was like, uh, <laughs> we like a warm bathroom, that's for sure. <laughs> so, but the little one here is a salesman sample. That's what the salesman would have taken around with him. 